Hey everybody, welcome to another CrushLivePoker.com hand review. And today we are going to take a look at a hand that I recently played on the Texas Card House live stream. Of course, Texas Card House is live streaming cash games every Monday and Thursday from 6 p.m. Central to 10 Central. So that's 7 p.m. Eastern to 11 Eastern. And on Mondays, it's basically a really, really big 5-5-10 game, 5-5 five, five with a 10 straddle. And then on Thursdays, it's a 1-3 match the stack game, which usually plays like a regular 5-5 five, five to 5-10 five, game. This is going to be an interesting hand that I played, and we're going to do a blackout job on our particular opponent's hand in this spot. This was played from this past Monday, February 3rd. You can always go back and watch the entire live stream. Uh, subscribe to TCH Live on YouTube, and they put up the entire live stream right after the fact. So here, we're going to be working off of actually a double straddle the blacks are hundreds, the greens are quarters, the, the uh, red ones are $5 chips. These are tip chips because in Texas, you are not allowed to chip with cash. So you'll see $1 tokes, but you'll also see tip chips that you need to use to tip the dealer. So they're not in play. The pinks are 500s. In this particular hand, we've got a double straddle on. So it's 5, 5, 10, 20. Now I had been playing pretty tight. I was pretty much card dead. The entire night i'd only started with 3000 so i was up about 700 and as you can see here out of uh seat 10 i'm going to open for a 70 dollar raise here with ace queen of clubs gets around to this guy gnome in seat two who i thought had been playing relatively tight you know he had just sort of come into the game and he three bets me from the hijack to 230 so i opened to 70 with the ace queen of clubs he three bets with a mystery hand to 230 from the hijack and at this point i think that i have a very very easy defend here with ace queen suited because nobody else called in between even though we did see quite a bit of people sort of cold calling three bets in between if someone had cold called a three bet like if gnome had three bet and someone had called i would be incentivized to four bet sometimes with my hand if I had ace queen offsuit and I thought that the player was particularly tight three betting me, I might consider a fold depending on the sizing. But usually here with ace queen suited, this is going to be played as a call. And unless the guy is really, really sort of out there, I'll probably be doing a fair amount of calling with ace king off, four betting, ace king suited, obviously four betting aces, sometimes four betting kings, sometimes playing it as a call. We're really not that deep considering the $20 uh, extra straddle. I mean, really, the hand's only played off about 175 blinds, but it is, or it should be a pretty tight configuration, me being in the effective under the gun and getting three bet by the under the gun plus two. So I decide to call, and you can see that the pot here is $500, and we get a very interesting flop here for me, or a very a decent flop. It comes out 734 here. With a couple of clubs, so obviously here I have flopped the nut flush draw. I've got two over cards and the nut flush draw. The pot is $500, and Gnome here is going to make a C-bet here of $190, which is just under 40% of the pot, and here is my first decision. So in general, when you flop flush draws that do have some showdown value, you don't always have to take them for semi-bluff raises. Now, obviously, like if you were to have a hand here like Kings and we were to just get it in, we would almost be flipping. It would be like 55, 45, something like that. But I think the advantage of having, say, Ace-King suited, Ace-Queen suited in a situation like this is that our hand does have showdown value. And also, if we call... Our opponent is going to be representing or barreling some of the cards that actually fit into our hand, like an ace, like a queen, something like that. If I were to have a lower nut flush draw, say, for example, I had an ace five of clubs here, which would be basically a huge draw. It would be a double gut shot to a deuce and to a six with clubs. And also, it's a hand that doesn't beat some of his ace x's here you know, like ace king, like ace queen, with that amount of equity and the fact that there isn't much showdown value, I probably would take this for a raise. Now, 
if I had ace four of clubs, which would be like a pair in a flush draw, I think that sort of fits into the same category as like an ace queen of clubs. I've got showdown value. I have a hammer lock on him if he just has a non paired ace high, because if his ace comes on the turn, I would make aces up. So where I would start to consider a check raise here possibly would be like with a hand like ace six of clubs. If I was in there with ace deuce of clubs, again, these are, you know, combo draws that have additional equity. Ace eight of clubs, which can turn some straight draws, things like that. And possibly ace nine, ace 10, and maybe to a lesser extent, ace jack, just because these don't beat some of the unpaired, maybe ace axes that my opponent would three bet. But here, specifically with ace queen of clubs, I usually like to take this hand as a call, and that's exactly what I do. That's why I don't check raise. I decide to call. So now the pot here is $880, and obviously we do have a fair amount of stack depth, and this is exactly what I'm talking about here now. Now I run into my ace. So if my opponent was you know, sort of setting up a double barrel, he is certainly going to represent this card here as well. And it's kind of hidden because I've sort of played my hand like I could have pocket eights, pocket nines. It looks like a really, really good barrel card here for him. So there's really nothing for me to do here. But once again, check. And I have all of those hands that I just mentioned sort of in my range. Now, if he were to check back here, and the river was a brick, I would obviously go for some value. And I think I'm going to get looked up by pairs like tens, jacks, queens, kings, you know, something like this. By the way, if I had ace king off here, especially with one club in my hand, ace king with the ace of clubs, ace king with the king of clubs, I'm going to check call here as well. And I'm going to run into an ace and I would have played it, you know, sort of in that manner as well. So I do check it over to him. And with the pop being 880, he is going to bet once again. He bets over half the size of the pot here. So the pot now is uh, 1300. He bets 450. And really, this is, I think, the easiest street for me to play. There really isn't much decision here. And when we think about way ahead, way behind, yes, oh, wow, I've got top pair and the nut flush draw. But a lot of times, I don't really have to protect against anything. If he's bluffing, he's not going to have much equity against my hand. The only sort of thing that you could say is the only reason why you would check raise here or check jam is possibly if you thought that your opponent would come off of ace king. And I really don't think that that's going to be likely with these stack sizes in a three bet pot. If my opponent did bet like a hand and if he was structuring correctly, like ace king of diamonds, say ace king with a backdoor flush draw on the flop, he hits the ace and now you know, bets it again, and I check raise, it's very, very unlikely that he's going to come really off of that hand. And it's the same thing if I arrive with really any other ace X of clubs here, you know, on the turn. So a lot of people look at top pair in a flush turn and like, oh, what a huge hand. I'm going to jam it. I'm going to jam it. But when you have top pair in a flush, I ask yourself, what's really the most efficient way to play it? Because you could have a real hammer lock on the hand where if you make an aggressive action, and the guy folds, you had him beat anyways. Let him bluff off. And if you can't get better to fold through your semi-bluff, then there's really no reason to semi-bluff. And that's why this hand sort of fits into a square call here without much decision on the turn. So I do make the call. And now the pot is 1,800. And you can see we've got about 2,900 left behind us. So about a pot and a half size bet. And the river here is an offsuit six. And I really expected that to shut a lot of the action down. I really expected this to go check, check. Sometimes I'll win. You know, if he has ace king, he's got ace king. He's probably wasn't going to come off of that anyways. So I wouldn't be, you know, super disappointed. So I think that like nine times out of 10, this is going to go check, check. Uh, when I check it and he does have ace king, I think he's definitely going to check it back. I think that this card hits me more than it hits him you know, possibly with like pocket fives, suited aces up. I don't really have any other types of two pairs besides the aces up suited if I decide to defend with them, like an ace seven, an ace four, an ace three suited. Um, ace five obviously makes a straight. I think that this would be way, way too thin 
to expect to get called down here and go three streets with Ace King. So, um, you know, it's debatable sometimes against some players you could go for value with Ace King. I just don't see it that much, and I don't expect to see a bet here from Ace King. So I do expect this to go check, check a lot. Of course, if he's got pocket aces, that's going to be a bet too. There's one combination of pocket aces. I could be unlucky and run into the one combination of pocket aces. So after I checked and he started going for chips, I was quite, quite surprised because I was like, wow, this is really, really strange. And the type of sizing that he's going to take is also quite polarizing. He ends up betting like 2,200 to 2,300 here at the end. Now, later on, actually, after this hand, he said he actually did a live misclick and he meant to bet 1,600 here instead of 23 or whatever he bet minus 500, he meant to bet 1,700. So he really puts me to the test here with a $2,200 bet, which is over the size of the pot. So I'm getting less than two to one. And I just sort of go back to, you know, my experience in live poker, also my knowledge of blockers and combinations of hands. I've got the nut flush draw. So when you start to think about the types of hands that he might three bet that are draws that have missed, like suited broadways, I block some of those, like in the form of king, queen of clubs, queen, jack of clubs. Of course, he could have like king, jack of clubs, king, 10 of clubs. But the fact that I have the queen of clubs in my hand is actually a bad thing here. So there's really only a couple of combinations of front door clubs that are basically like unpaired that would have to like take this line or possibly like turn something into a bluff like six, eight of clubs or, you know, something like that. The five X of clubs make a straight, like if you had like, you know, for example, four or five of clubs, something like that. I mean, you'd really have to like dig deep King, Jack, King, 10, Jack, 10, eight, nine of clubs, total air, you know, in a spot like this, like just absolute air, like King, queen of diamonds. When usually when you get to this spot and someone's, and I've done thousands of hours of live stream commentary, and obviously I've played over 10,000 hours of live poker. I don't even know if I've ever seen somebody just make a random three street bluff with a hand like king, queen of diamonds, king, jack of diamonds, which might start a bet on the flop and barrel this turn. Usually they're going to give up. This is an extremely under bluffed spot uh, because of the run out. So knowing that Gnome was a little bit on the tighter side and knowing that this is very, very rarely a bluff I just, you know, like I said, I was flabbergasted by the bet, but then I was just like, this is just going to be, I don't think that I'm good here one out of three times, which is basically what this is. Now, if you were to look at this from an MDF perspective, which of course is minimum defense frequency, I'm getting, we'll call it two to one in pot odds, which means I got to be one good one out of three times. If he's betting the pot, that means that I actually have to defend with 50% of the hands that I arrive with here uh, in terms of you know, what my hand strength is so that he doesn't basically have a profitable bluff here because he's, you know, like I said, we're going to call it a, a pot size bet. He's basically risking 2000 to win 2000. So that's where the MDF comes. Like I have to defend at 50 with 50% of the hands that I arrive with here so that he can't profitably bluff me. I have to be good here one out of three times in pot odds, 33% of the time. Sometimes people get a little bit confused by that. Now, is ace queen of clubs going to be in the top 50% of hands that I arrive with here uh, on this run out? It's possible. It's probably pretty close. I do have some ace kings. Also, I have some fives. I have sets uh, that are played like this that sometimes slow play off. We talked about I have some aces up. I think the factor... One of the key inflection points here is that I do have the queen of clubs and I block some of these club draws. And also that I don't think that any, that people in live poker are really bluffing this spot nearly enough. It's given up quite a bit. So I, I just, I, I don't think that I necessarily, you know, I'm, I think it's an under bluff spot. So maybe I don't necessarily need to defend at the MDF, even though the theory says, well, you know, he's only, he's risking 
a pot size bet. So I have to defend with 50%, you know, the top 50% of the hands that I, that I arrive with here at the end. But if the spot is traditionally under bluffed, where it skews towards value, then that goes out the window somewhat and uh, you're not going to have to defend all that much. So I end up making a tough fold, you know, on the surface and we'll do a reveal here and we can see here that he has a very light seven five of hearts, which is a straight. So he flopped top pair with a gut shot to a six continuation bet value protection bet. He turns extra equity with a one card double gutter to a deuce and to a six perfect barrel card for him. Very good barrel card for him. And then of course on the river, he makes his hand and he decides to basically polarize here. I feel like, you know, if I were to have ace king off, there are several combos obviously of ace king off that are better than say the suited ace queens. Uh, it would be close. You know, you call down linearly, you, you know, the difference between having ace king and ace queen is if he were to be going for the sizing occasionally with ace king, you know, you would tie. But like I said, I think this is a very, very under bluffed spot. And, um, you know, if he had sized down, obviously it would have been a, a more difficult decision, but this really comes back to don't go crazy with your nut flush draws. Think about what you want to accomplish. And sometimes when you don't make it, even when you, you know, turn top pair, um, depending on the run out, you're not going to have the best hand in here. I make the correct lay down. Thanks for watching this video. And if you like what you've seen, please hit the subscribe button. And if you want to check out poker training videos, head over to crushlivepoker.com. You can use the coupon code in the description for the first month for free.